Everybody, Kent Martz here from Explorer Scientific. Paul, we got sound now? Yeah, I had to restart. Huh. Had, didn't have sound when we started. Anyway, good Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, Friday. Today's Friday, isn't it? Friday. Oh, it has to be Friday. This is focused on astrophotography. It's Friday. And for some of us who may be watching, it may already be Saturday. Welcome to today's Amazon Live broadcast. Uh, we're going to be focusing on how to get into astrophotography. Lots of ways to do it. If you've got a DSLR, you're ready to start doing astrophotography. But if you want to up your game a little bit, you need to go to a telescope and your DSLR and a tracker mount like the iXos 100 that we have in front of me. Let's talk about the mount a little bit first. The mount runs off of a battery pack that is a separate accessory, or you can use the battery pack you have, uh, you know, a lithium ion battery pack. The beautiful part about the mount is it's engineered to be used by small telescopes like this ED80 uh, I've got here, extra low dispersion glass. ED stands for extra low dispersion glass. A high quality glass with proprietary coatings, a great way to start astrophotography. People who want to start astrophotography sometimes will get a really big telescope, right? A huge telescope, and they find it's very difficult. The beautiful thing about a small telescope and a DSLR you already own is that it is small and forgiving. With all that magnification you get with a bigger telescope, you also magnify all your problems. And I really believe in getting started and finding success and building on that success. So one way to do it is the iXos 100 tracker right here. It's over in the carousel for you uh, to pick up at a great price. It's got digital stepper motors. Older mounts have uh, just DC drive motors, servo motors, and you apply power, they turn on full blast and they just push as hard as they can. These motors have a torque limit set on them that we set on the little circuit board that runs them. And what does that do? The motors here and here hit that torque limit and instead of just continuing to grind, they let go. Now it can cause some problems, uh, a sound that sounds like it's a problem, but that's not a problem. All it's doing is when it's counting its micro steps to go somewhere, when the torque limit gets set, it just loses its step count. No damage is done. And so, how do you run it? Well, I've got an Android tablet right here. This is a probably seven or eight year old tablet, maybe even older. And I'm, it's an Android tablet. And I am going to real quick. Whatever you're I wanted to use this one. So I'm real quick going to find out what's running in the background. I'm going to clear all of them. And I'll do that by hitting the square button. And now I'm going to go to the home screen. I'm going to go to the home screen. It takes a while. It's a slow tablet, but this is going to work. I'm going to go to the settings. And I have never connected this tablet up to this mount before, I'm pretty sure. And I'm going to tap on the Wi-Fi button. And I see it's PMC86358. And I guess I have. Let's see. Um, I'm going to tell it connect. I have already connected to this mount before. If I didn't, the password would be PMC-EIGHT. That's the password. It's not a secret password. It's just to sort of force you to connect to make sure you're connecting to your mount. Once this tablet's connected, it's going to remember it and go on down the road. Now, what you're going to see here on this tablet, it gives you this message right here. And it says, Internet, what does it say? Internet unavailable. And people sort of freak out sometimes when they see that because they go, oh my gosh, I don't have any internet. Well, this tablet is programmed to look for the internet when it connects to Wi-Fi. This mount is sending out a Wi-Fi signal, but it's not connected to the internet. It's connected up to the hardware that runs this mount. So you're going to get this signal and you're just going to, this message, you're going to say, okay, and go on down the road. Now back to the home screen, hit the circle button. I'm going to launch Explore Stars. And there we go. Hopefully the battery's not going to die on this. Nope, we got a good battery yet. I'm going to launch Explore Stars. There it is. It's up. Relaunch it because I closed it. And I'm going to simply go menu, uh, catalog. Uh, I'm going to go to the solar system button. And I'm going to click on the sun. And I'm going to tell it to slew the object. And there we go. Off we go. Now then, if we were going to really slew to the sun inside, outside, we don't want to make sure we had a solar safe filter on here, right? Or the lens cap, because we don't want to damage the optics or a camera that may be attached on here. That's all there is to it. 
Now, you do have to polar align, which means this axis right here, this axis has to be aligned to either the north celestial pole if you live in the northern hemisphere or the south celestial pole if you live in the southern hemisphere. Polar alignment is a skill you have to learn. It's easy to do, and this mount makes it, uh, especially starting out, it has a two-star alignment system. You learn to get it close to Polaris, and then you can do two stars, and it triangulates the difference, applies that to the to the software in here and makes that mathematical correction. We do have a video that shows you how to do one way to do a polar alignment, and it's gonna come up right now. Hey everybody, Kent Martz here from Explore Scientific. Today I'm gonna to teach you how to polar align your telescope using a broom. Why do you need to polar align? Well, for the telescope that has an equatorial mount, you have to get that equatorial axis lined up with the rotation of the Earth. And to do that, we're going to start with the tripod. We're going to decide which one of these legs is going to point north, and we're going to set the tripod down so that leg is pointed north. First thing I'm going to do is use a level to make sure my tripod is level, so if it's tipped one side or the other, that's going to cause your polar alignment to not be accurate. So we're going to use a level for that purpose. Then, we're going to take a compass, and just to make sure that I've got it pointed north, I'm going to use the compass line up and go, yep, that looks like it's pointed north. So here's what I'm going to do now. And this is where the broom comes in. The broom becomes a measurement device, if you will. So I'm going to put the broom on the ground with the tip of it right against the north leg of the tripod. And I'm going to back away. And I'm going to use the compass, I'm going to close one eye, and I'm going to use the compass to make sure that the broom is lined up with north, right? And so I can tell I'm off just a little bit, so I'm, I'm going to move the tripod just, just a little off. bit, and I'm going to hey, turn Paul. the broom, Paul. and the broom is just trying to stand that line with to line up. It, it won't wake up. To magnetic north. Right here is we're going to talk about something called magnetic declination. The magnetic north is not true north. The difference between true north and magnetic north can be off by as much as 15 or 16 degrees if you live on the east coast or west coast of the United States. Around the world it varies and you have to figure out what that is for where you live because if you point at magnetic north you're not going to be pointing at true north. You can be off by 15 degrees. Your go-to will never be accurate. So for this system to work, you have to know what that offset is and be able to program that into your compass. We're going to provide a link to a, a, a website and a video that talks about that a whole lot more. Now, we're going to make sure that the tripod is not angled wrong. I'm going to use a small tape measure, and we're simply going to come down here and be careful not to move the broom, and I'm going to measure the distance from the tripod leg to the center of the broom. That is 400 and 70 centimeters. That way it is 470, a little, I'm going to call that good. Actually, I'm going to move the tripod a couple of millimeters just like that. So now we know that we're lined up true north with that leg and these two legs are the, equal, are the equal distance from right here, so it's not pushed that way or that way. So now that we have the tripod with a good alignment to the north, we have to put the head on the mount. And that's going to entail this. We're going to be very careful when we do this, because we don't want to move the tripod. We're going to put it on and simply screw on the polar head just like this. Remembering everything's going to the north. Now, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to do the same thing. You can do the same exact same in the southern hemisphere because it's not polar. It's polar alignment. We just don't use the star Polaris, which we're not using here. This is really good if you can't see Polaris or if it's daytime and you want to do some solo, solar viewing with a solar safe filter. So the last step of this process is to check the scale of your altitude, right? So we live at 36 degrees north. And I am going to turn the altitude 
until it gets to 36 degrees north. I'm going to stop. And that's it. With this system, using a broom, a compass, and a tape measure, you can achieve a good, decent starting polar alignment. Personally, I've used this. I've got an amazingly close polar alignment. There's ways that you can use to refine your polar alignment, specifically drift alignment. But it all starts with a good polar alignment. You can do this in the daytime. You can do this in the nighttime if you can't see Polaris. It works all the time. It's a good way to get started learning the process of polar alignment. Isn't that great? I hope you've enjoyed this video. For Explore Scientific, I'm Kent Martz. Get out there and start doing astronomy. And keep looking up. And there you go, folks. A good way to, dad joke alert, clean up your polar alignment. Uh, we don't have the monitor, the screen up, so you're going to have to relay me the questions. Nope, you have to relay the questions to me. Ton dude tech music? Yeah. Let's see, I get my audio going here. Hang on. Where's, Where's my, my audio? audio? Oh, there it is. All right. Dude tech music, mute music. He says, hello, I just have to ask, what is better, taking a picture of, in my case, Jupiter with a DSLR or astro camera? I'm pondering how I want to answer that. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses. A digital camera that you already own obviously is less expensive than buying a dedicated astro camera. But then because of pixel sizes and focal lengths and all sorts of stuff, there's a lot to uh, doing um, uh, planetary astrophotography. Most of the really sharp, astounding pictures you see are taken in video mode and they'll take three or four or five minutes of video and then run it, into a pro run it through a program that breaks up that long video into its individual pieces and then they run it through an algorithm, a program, that looks at each frame and analyzes the ones that are in focus, sharpest focus, and excludes the rest. You can tell it to you want to use all of them. You want to use 80, exclude 20% of them. Most people, I think, probably keep the best 20 or 30%. It puts them, those best images into a folder, and then you run it through another program or another algorithm in the same program, and you stack all those images up and then you know, manipulate them. So those images where you, she, where you see that, like say Jupiter and Saturn are really sharp and really crisp, none of those are single exposures. They're all stacked up. And how that works is the image you're trying to go after, the planet, and this will work in digital as well. This will work with this camera, but because of uh, pixel sizes and things that I'm not an expert in, uh, but I understand it, uh, you can uh, stack up those images and the signal to noise principle applies. The signal is the image. It's what you're trying to get is the, the pixels with um, Jupiter, Saturn or whatever. And this is the same thing works in deep sky photography uh, when you're shooting galaxies and things like that. Uh, the signal is always in the same spot. The noise is random. And so you stack them up and all that noise disappears and all the signal that's always in the same spot really comes out and really gets enhanced. That's how those pictures of Jupiter and Saturn and other planets get processed. Now then, there's also other aspects of digital uh, photography, whether you astrophotography, whether you're using a DSLR or a dedicated astro cam, where you put your lens cap on and you take pictures of the inside of your lens cap. What does that do? Well, the amp glow that's coming off of the amplifier that runs the sensor in your camera creates heat. And that heat blooms over onto your sensor and it can mess up your pictures and show up. So you can take pictures of the inside of your lens cap and you can subtract those out. That'll also subtract out any hot pixels that you have. A hot pixel is a pixel that's just never empties out, it's always just there. Tends to be a red, looks red on pictures. So Pekka. I, the, let me finish this real quick. The other thing you can do is stretch a white t-shirt with even, even illumination and take a picture of a white piece of cardboard or something 
and that allows you to then subtract out any vignetting and curvature and other things that are in there. So there's techniques to use that are more than just taking your picture and going click of a pretty sunset like I do with my phone all the time. What you got? What's Pekka Peck got, Paul? He says, if I use a crop sensor, do I have to add the image or add the crop factor to focal length when stacking the images? I don't um, think Kent I'm, has that answer. I'm going to think through this. Do you have to add the crop The crop sensor? It's just like on a DSLR. If you have a crop sensor, it adds, well, it, effectively adds focal length to the camera it's called lens. A, Go ahead, probably Paul. a micro four third. Yeah, so I would say that if the program doesn't automatically pick up on it, you should see if there's a selection for that in the program. If not, I would assume it automatically picks up and adjusts to the micro four thirds. <laughs> It's raining again here. I thought it quit yeah. raining. It's not no. raining again. It's going to rain so, all weekend. So I think the answer is yes. Squirrel. You have to. It's going to make the focal. It's going to make the apparent focal length of your telescope that you're using or your camera lens longer. Like if you use a crop sensor on a 300 millimeter, it's really more like what Paul, 450 or something like that. But it no. Uh, so it, it's it, the equivalent right. of. But right. all you're doing is cropping ahead of time because you don't yeah. have the rest of the sensor. Right. So you're only using this very smallest center of the lens, no. whether it's a telescope or it's a photography lens. Yeah, so, so it's not really like shooting with this longer lens. You're, it's just pre-cropped. It's, like di it's digital crop. It's like no, a, it's not a digital crop. Well, yeah, it's no, not. a micro four thirds you're camera. The, so no, you're using the central portion of the image. No. The yeah. micro four thirds ca uh, sensor cannot take in the same amount of light as a full frame sensor. It's not as big. Right. Right. But it doesn't exist. It's like a postage stamp versus a standard business card. Yes. Kind of thing. Right. Now, one benefit to that, though is that if your camera lens has a, a strong field curvature, so you're not getting a flat field, you're only using the central part where the curvature is least, yep. it'll eliminate a lot of the field curvature, which creates coma in the edges of your pictures, and you don't but get the streaks. If you were using a full frame, right? you're still going to cover that same amount of pixels, that same area. So, technically, it could be different for each camera. There's micro four, thir micro four thirds that have a more dense of a pixel area. But you've got all sorts of variables in there. <laughs> yeah. There's, because sensors have smaller pixels or bigger pixels, pixels. That makes a huge difference. You know, it's a. But if you compare apples to apples, a 35 millimeter versus a crop sensor through the same telescope with the same settings at the same object, they, you should be able to take that micro four thirds Set it on and top. drop it right in the center right. of that 35 millimeter and you can't tell. Yeah, set it on top. It's a yeah. weird effect. Like, and I actually did this because somebody didn't believe me one time. I took a picture of a building with a uh, 28 millimeter lens on my film camera and then took it with a 300 millimeter lens from the same exact spot on the tri mounted on a tripod and you can set the image of the uh, telephoto image directly on top of the wide angle and they're exactly the same size it's a weird thing that's yeah now you're talking about focal lengths and background compression okay, but as far as the but as far as the size of the thing, it was exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, Can you do this polar alignment with this method with a mop or a shovel asking for a smart alley? Hey, uh, Jim, you can use any straight edge that you want. I, you can use a crooked edge as far as I'm concerned. As long as it's sort of straight, it's going to give you a good alignment. So um, the key to that system we saw is understanding magnetic declination. Because if you 
in, in the United States, if you live on the west coast or the east coast, your magnetic declination, in other words, your error with a, mat, with a compass can be off 15 or 16 degrees. One will be west, will point west of, of, of um, uh, the magnetic pole, and one will point east 15 or 16 degrees. So you could be off by a massive amount if you just use a magnetic compass you're going to miss Pol Polaris by 15 degrees or 13 degrees or whatever. So it's a, understand how to, how to correct that and account for it. Um, Tom Dutek Music, Ton, uh, awesome way to pull it on a scope. I did it with my 8-inch Newt and it kept tracking target. It works, or it, yeah, Newtonian, 8-inch Newtonian, it kept tracking the targets. And uh, knowing now the pop-up as your device is not protected has popped up. We had trouble with the laptop. It wouldn't wake up that we used to pump the comments onto my screen. And Noah's been over here banging on it with uh, the uh, Amazon Live Fix-It hammer. Uh, most assuredly. So Full anyway. frame is an arbitrary term. Some sensors are larger, some are smaller. Hey. It's not really arbitrary. Full frame is a 35 millimeter. That's it's the same size as, a, as what the exposure paper piece of it was on the negative. Yeah, on a 35 millimeter. On a 35 millimeter camera. Right. It's not, and then a micro th four thirds is, it's all these things are very standard. Yeah, but I like the way that that, that thinking though it, some sensors are larger and some sensors are smaller. They make sensors now that are big sensors, you know. Uh, like, oh, the Hasselblad yeah, my dad. has <laughs> yeah. a, a large format yeah. sensor, which is huge. The red camera we had in the studio this week has a sensor that's really wide to do the 2 3 aspect ratio. A movie. So it size. depends on what you're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. my dad had a, a Yashica mat that shot. Uh, two and a quarter inch negatives and boy those are big beautiful negatives I'll tell you what those are yeah, fun to work with. that's the yeah. large those, format camera you know I never worked with a he had he had a five by seven camera but he had a Polaroid back on it so I never really played with five by seven negatives I've seen some and uh, five by seven negatives and eight by ten negatives boy the detail on those would just be astounding but astrophotography so how do you hook your camera up to an ED80 well I'm going to show you've you. got about Five minutes. Five Ken. minutes. Oops, there we go. All right, so we can do this real quick. I'll get this turned so you can see it. A little less than that. I'm going to take off the diagonal because it's set up for Ken visual. Ken didn't right show now. up on time again. Yep. Ken had to take care of some urgent business. So and we. Uh, I changed the camera. So we have uh, our extension tube, and for astrophotography, I should have two extension tubes on here. I didn't mess with grabbing them, but there should be two three extension tubes on here. It may take three. It may take four. It all depends on how everything matches together. This is the new Explorer Scientific Field Flattener. Uh, Actually, for two and a half for a Sony camera is what it's going to take. So every camera is going to be different. It yeah. all depends on how deep the sensor is because there's depth there. But this is Explorer Scientific Field Flattener uh, FF2. F5 slash F7 is its skew. It's new field flattener we came out with. It's for short focal length telescopes. <coughs> In this case, the 102, but it'll fit on a 102 or an ED80. <coughs> Excuse me. And so on the end of it right here, it's got a plate that screws off, so you can put on an adapter plate that's got an M48, 48 millimeter hole in it. This is the M42, which is standard T-frame. So how do we hook a camera to this? It's real simple and straightforward. You use what's called a T-ring. And this T-ring looks exactly like the end, over here on this camera so you can see it, looks exactly like the end of the lens, right? So this basically is just the lens end. So all I'm going to do is Put it into the camera, line up the red dots, right? That's what you always do. You line up the you red dots. You should do dots. this in a clean environment and don't point the sensor up. Keep it pointed down and at all times to keep the dust from falling inside. And the you cavity. really don't want to, you know, set it on a cloth table either. So now we're simply going to screw in the field flattener to the camera. Getting one of those little puffer things is in. very recommended. And there we go. 
the camera is now attached to our ED80 telescope and we're ready to start taking pictures. Now, focus is going to be uh, probably the hardest part of this. Uh, if you're doing solar, doing it at night, not so much because you can see the pixels. But if you're outside doing solar like Paul and I were earlier this week, finding focus is a challenge. It's, it's difficult to do. Uh, so that's the hardest part, I think, of astrophotography for, for a lot of people other than this, this figuring out the exposure and tracking. And so now if we've got a perfect polar alignment, this telescope is going to track whatever it wants to uh, we pointed at across the sky, right? So I've got to explore stars. Now then, I've got this on an Android. On an Android, at least the tablets I've had it's been around, you cannot set it so um, it won't go to sleep. It'll go to sleep every 20 minutes. And I just got in the habit of keeping it awake, keeping it awake, keeping it awake, right? And Pushing a rock. Pushing a rock, pushing a rock. Now I've got a keyboard up. Dad gummit. <clears throat> got about two minutes. Two minutes. So here we go. We're going to make it go somewhere real quick. Let's make it go to, let's see what messy objects are up. Uh, pseudo objects, something in Draco. There we go. And off it goes. It's going to point at something in the northern hemisphere because Draco is close and Ursa Major is in the uh, northern hemisphere, uh, circumpolar up close to the pole. So it's going to point at it. It's just going to turn the telescope and point at it. And now it's going to follow that spot all the way across the sky until it sits in the western sky. Um, it's done. It'll just track. You've got a good polar alignment. It's just going to go. Now, you want really good polar alignment or really good tracking, you've got to use a guide camera. What's a guide camera? It's a little camera and a little telescope that you can mount in the hot shoe where the finder goes. It finds a bright star, it locks on it, and it just keeps tracking that star across the sky. It sends pulses to the mount that tell the mount how much to move because it wants to keep that bright star on one pixel. And it'll do everything it can to do that. What that does is it gives you really good tracking. So we got started late. We're going to end a little bit late for Explore Scientific here on Amazon Live. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Appreciate the questions that you've had. I'm going to sign off and go have a weekend. I hope your weekend is pleasant, great, and remember, be kind to everyone. I'm Kent Martz with Explore Scientific. Bye-bye, everybody. out to find the perfect focus for your eye. When viewing the moon, I put it in my star diagonal so I can switch eyepieces on the fly. Great idea. If you have an inch and a quarter diagonal, you can put in an inch and a quarter uh, neutral density filter. Or if you have a two inch diagonal, you can put in a two inch neutral density filter. Obviously, the two inch neutral density filter is going to cost you more than the standard inch, than the traditional inch and a quarter eyepieces. So if you're out there uh, and just join us here on Amazon Live, click that follow button. We would love to pick up a follow from you. And again, we've picked up uh, Oculus today. Again, we can't say how much we appreciate you uh, because you're sharing your time with us and we truly do appreciate that very much. So got another question. With, from Tariq with uh, Mac, I don't need neutral density because the Mac takes care of brightness perfectly. Yes, um, when Tariq says Macs, he means uh, uh, Macs at Tov, Cassegrain telescopes, and they have an inherently long focal length which reduces the brightness of the light. Uh, Tariq, I want to use a refractor for solar imaging, and I want to stop down the aperture. I prefer something done by manufacturer than DIY and for HI. 
I won't use a neutral DC filter. Tariq, unless you're, as long as you're using a solar safe filter, you don't need to stop it down any at all. It's not required. Uh, and you can't stop down the sun enough to be able to photograph it without a safe neutral density filter because when you just keep stopping it down, you're just going to create a pinpoint of incredibly bright light that you're never going to be able to take a, a picture of the surface of the sun with. So if you're using something like our sun catcher solar filters, and Tariq, I know you've seen us talk about this before, the sun catcher, large aperture um, solar filter is a uh, thousand oaks mylar film that reflects 99 point whatever uh, nearly all the sunlight that's hitting it and it has some uh, film in there also that gives it a pleasing yellow uh, orange color depending on how your eyes look at it that allows you to see the visible surface of the sun you're going to see sunspots it does not allow you to see loops and prominences and things like that but it if does it, let you see sunspots. And by the way, if you try to cut the sun, yeah, uh, on after it's got into your telescope, all you're doing is concentrating that energy, and you're going to, it's going to like a laser go straight through your head and out the back of your skull. Yeah. It may not be that bad, but it's not, <laughs> it's going to poke your eye out. It'll yeah. it it will burn. It will instantly etch your retina and cornea. It'll be brutal and it won't ever go away. My Mac yeah, Wintinson burns my again. eyes on a full moon, Osmosis 007. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it all depends on what kind of Mac you use and how long it is, what, how long the focal length is. But yeah, 120, you know, big Macs collect like a 152 Mac or a 180 millimeter Mac to top cast of grain uh, is concentrating a whole bunch of light, even though it may be a focal length of 1,900 millimeters or 2,200 millimeters is still uber bright. What's crazy is the think, moon's color is like, yeah. you know, a couple year old black asphalt, not quite black, and it still, Paul, reflects that much like electricity. So I think that much Tariq energy. was talking about HA filters. Uh, okay, for HA, it's a completely alpha. different story. That's why he's saying, yes, um, you know, I, you're going to have to consult your HA filter provider for that on wh how much, you know, what they need to stop down. I know that uh, I've used both over the weekend, went to a star party Friday night uh, outside of a bar, had a great time, multiple hundreds of people uh, looked through our telescopes. Uh, we had a quark. A, I think it's a Daystar Quark energy rejection filter that was really nice. People were, were, you know, in a low power view of the sun, looking at the sunspots. And we also had a hydrogen alpha uh, double stack. Uh, the guy that, that owns that, uh, Tyler, uh, could not get the uh, tuning exactly right, so he took the double stack off and went with a, it's like a 70 millimeter telescope. It was not a big telescope, but provides some really awesome views yeah. uh, of the hydrogen alpha region. It wasn't very active. There wasn't much to see. Although, right now, folks, there are a ton of sunspots. If you've not gotten into solar viewing, you need to do that. And one really quick, inexpensive, yet safe way is with a sun catcher large aperture solar filter. It comes already assembled in this uh, cardboard yeah. case. And this is for the film. visual, yes. that, not it's you, you know you can't see hydrogen alpha with right, your this, naked eye. This is for for straight white light, right? Yeah. We color it yellow so it looks pleasing because it's not just a, uh, you know, it's not just white light. The quark that we were looking at does show white light. So this uh, system, you can order one that fits your telescope. Uh, Osmosis uh, says the moon is totally underappreciated. So much fun following the Terminator shadows. Uh, in craters, absolutely. That's the fun part of watching the moon is following the Terminator across the face of the moon uh, as it works its way up to full and then as it goes away from full. That is an awesome uh, thing to watch. What I like is, hello, Kent and all from Mike Overacker. Hey, Mike, thanks for answering that question for me. Truly appreciate it. 
uh, and you answered it thoroughly, it appeared. So thank you very much, Mike. Referring to what a question, Mike had uh, has uh, motorized our 20-inch Dobsonian telescope. I sent the link. Somebody uh, in. And he, uh, there was a customer who has bought one and was wanting to put setting circles on it so he would be able to. I got it. Four minutes, 52 Ten. seconds. Ten true or false and six questions. What? Four minutes, 52 seconds. Why? Why did you go out and go?
everybody. We're back. I am so enthused. <laughs> So this super, is the comedy so hour with Andy tired. and Tyler. <laughs> no, we are, um, I'm on here today because Tyler had. We had a dropout. We had a dropout. We had a, that doesn't sound very nice. Uh, we had someone that was scheduled, um, but she had a medical issue. And obviously I can't control medical issues. So I said, okay, fine. I guess I can go home. But she said no. <laughs> so we're apparently on my two hours of sleep uh we're going she's going to school me on astrophotography questions so prepare no 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 it's going to be on space questions because i couldn't oh, find no, astrophotography no, questions, no questions. <laughs> oh, darn it. the cursed astrophotography so here's so here's right. the deal tyler is whiny and cranky and so i thought this would be a great humorous time to do some questions for him i feel bad for hello everybody. mike hello sentinel or sentinel sentinel Oh God! Synthol I'm gonna learn one day. Sorry. It's sinful. Nagapen. He's on every global star party. Come on. But am I on every global star party? You should be. You're the global. You're the liaison. Oh whatever. I'm the liaison. So basically, nothing. you're going to school me because the sighing gnome in the background is. So you're gonna school me in space? You're gonna ask me questions about space, even though I it's out there. But I guarantee you, I won't. Well, it's answer. like a mixture of planets and space, and just there are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just because I'm wearing the yes, NASA Mike. Shirt, yes, <laughs> he came to the he came to the I the prepare. game prepared. So there's uh, ten true and false questions, oh, and yeah. six you have to answer them. Questions. So my my next question is: Is the can the audience participate? Yes, please participate. But if you're going to give answers, make sure you give them the wrong one. Because when I was typing this for, this up today, Tyler kept going by my desk trying to hey, sneak a peek at the you answers. You ain't cheating. You ain't trying. He's cheating. And I got caught, so I wasn't He's trying He's a cheater, hard cheater, pumpkin eater. That's what I was just thinking. There Look you go. Me. I don't want that thing. It's red. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You bought it. Why are you? I know. You heard him, and it's on live air, and it's been recorded that he doesn't want it, Paul. No, it's not for Paul. No. It's not for Paul. No, you can find something I else. Better microphones anyway. All right, cool. That's great. Okay, are we ready to get this party started? Whoop, whoop. Yeet, yeet. We did Lucy, this yesterday with Kent. As Lucy says, yeet, yeet. <laughs> yeet uh, Lucy, well, some of you have seen Lucy on our Amazon show. Hey, Pekka. She's our customer service yep. rep. One of our customer service reps. Okay, so number one. Oh, gosh. Are you ready? No. Let's go do it. I will not look since apparently I can't look at a question. It is completely silent in space. No. <laughs> it's false. Why is that false? <laughs> Unless Paul's out there, then <laughs> yeah, you can hear him from everywhere. How do you how do you know that that's false? Come on, you gotta back up your answer. I mean, the, you can hear sound in space. Granted, no. air you can hear sound. Because we recorded sound from space. So I'm still going with... Are you with, sure is it made up? No, I'm going with... I'm going with there is sound in space. You are true. That is true. It is false. There, NASA sound. uses a technique called data sonification to take signals from radio waves, plasma waves, and magnetic fields and convert them into audio tracks. Hang on, to wait. Hear, you said radio wave. To hear, what's happen to hear what's happening in space. Radio wave is a sound, a form of frequency. The sounds range from ambulance-like screeches to beeps reminiscent of an alien spaceship making it its approach. Could be if you launch Pekka says there's enough. no atmosphere to carry the sound waves. Has he been there? Have you been there? Some days. He has a question for you, by the way. I know he's got a question. We'll get to it, Pekka. Number two. Why don't you just let it? Why don't you just All right, it? Pekka, go ahead and ask it. <laughs> Shoot, buddy. And I'll ask him the next question. We'll, we'll see if we I have can a tag feeling, it. I know what I think I know what it's This like. is what I have to deal with you every wish you would deal with day. The sunsets on Mars are, 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 are yellow. They're orange here. Sunsets on Mars are yellow. True or false? True or false. True. The crop factor. Kent didn't answer the crop factor question. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to scold him. Gonna have to scold him. But I think it's true because of the gases on Mars in the atmosphere. It is false. NASA so. said this is because it's blue because NASA NASA says this is because dust in the Martian 
atmosphere has fine particles that permit blue light to penetrate the atmosphere more efficiently than longer wavelength colors like yellow, orange, and red. So the sunset on Mars are blue. Hey, it'd be pretty cool to see, actually. I think that I think we have. I think we have. We told, somebody said we had pictures of the sunset on Mars. We told Pekka, Kent and I. Hold the phone. If you're going to bring it about photography. Let's stop it. No, it's, It could be different. I just want to make sure that it's no, right no, answer. I, I, I totally admit that okay. it could be wrong for what you're trying to do. But in photography, a crop sensor is... You're going to get the same center image is yeah. as if you had a full frame. It's just yes. bigger sensor. I'm going to Google it right now to make sure I get the correct answer to Pekka, and then uh, yeah, you can go ahead with the next question. <laughs> He's going to look up an answer to another I question sure while he answers right. my question. No. Uh, okay, <clears throat> launching things in space is widely expensive. Uh, yeah. That is true. I mean, Art How much is Artemis right now in the billions of dollar range and it got postponed? Payload space uh, specialist and space station engineer Ravi Margashahinadin. Margus butcher Sorry, I butchered that. Told Business Insider in 2016 that each pound of cargo used to uh, use, uh, to co cost uh, 10000 to ship into space. Prices have skyrocketed since. Mm -hmm. Costs are about 43180 per pound. Per pound. And SpaceX new carrier is about 27000 per pound. Holy In God. photography, I'm to follow up here with Pekka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he asked a question. So I put it up on the screen. So it does. It does affect it. Well, I, he's, he's, he's searching, so I... In photography, mm -hmm. you emulate the focal length but it's not actually correct it's not actually the focal length it's just a crop because the bigger the focal length the more compressed your background becomes and if you're using a crop sensor that's why crop sensors don't have the thick bokeh that a regular, a regular full frame would have because you're not, not you're only you're seeing that center, center spot. spot but we don't have bokeh he he asked know. about yeah. camera lenses true i haven't seen that question let's see i wouldn't think a crop sensor would mess with your focal length right it can by I don't, crop factor. I don't think you can go. I think there's but lenses. There's certain lenses, like on I my Canon. There's with, certain lenses made with for my crop sensor, but I can't get as, I can't get as, I can't get the ones with full frame. I mean, for the, yeah, full frame see, sensor. Someone's gonna have to correct me because you're you're putting a, a naked sensor on the telescope, so you're using the whole image, pix the pixels, the whole image scale in the, the telescope you're not using a different telephoto lens right that either accepts or doesn't accept the crop either a micro four thirds or whatever but i think he's talking about photo photographic lenses yeah so 50 millimeter lens is 50 millimeter yeah. no a 50 millimeter lens you're going to <laughs> Crop in, and that's where the crop factor comes in. And that's 35, isn't it? On a crop factor with a 50? Yeah, yeah 38, it, 39. Lens for full frame cameras? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They have everything. So are they lens. different? Are, there folk, are they different? No. Then? So I don't know. I don't mess with DSLRs enough to know. Is I with dedicated astronomy cameras, you don't you don't mess with the crop factor. Yeah, at yeah. all. Because it doesn't exist. Um, um so again, so again, when you, yeah, take, you take the lenses, the lenses that we use on a Sony E mount uh -huh. can go on a Sony crop sensor mount or a full frame mount. And when you put it on the crop sensor, you're seeing the center part of the glass. Mm -hmm. When you put it on a full frame, you're seeing all the way out to the, to the very furthest edge. 
So, so it's still 50 so millimeter, it's but it's the equivalent, equivalent of a 35, 38. But it's not an actual 35, 38. It's still a 50 millimeter. The bokeh, the sharpness, the more, all that's going to remain the same. It's not going to change just because you're on a crop sensor. So it, B and H posted a thing that says crop factor does not affect the lens focal length or affect the lens aperture at all. Right. Because right. it doesn't matter. And like yeah. putting a telescope on it is just like putting a lens on it. You're so. just putting a lens yeah. on it at that point. Uh, 35 millimeter format. See, I think that's where digital sensor go ahead and go to your next question if you don't mind okay moving on to my next question space is full of space junk yes that's true <laughs> so i tried to give him some easy ones Thank because you. we're going to get into some hard space Thank is you. full of junk like used rocket parts and dead satellites these objects continue to orbit earth at about seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour 10 times as fast as a speeding bullet Wow. The Space Surveillance Network keeps track of how much debris is out there and who's responsible for it. Isn't that crazy? So, so Beatrice be and yeah, Sentel. Beatrice is right. And I just found. So if you have a camera with an APS-C sensor. A, That's a crop that's a sensor. Yeah. So circa 15 by 6 by 23.5. Micro four thirds. Yes. Or 14 by 8 by 22.2 on a Canon. You plug in all the numbers, you will get a crop factor of crop factor of 1.5 or a 1.6 for a Canon. And then to find the equivalent focal length of the new field of view afforded by the smaller APS-C sensor, you multiply the true focal length of the lens by 1.5 or to get the 35 millimeter equivalent focal length of the lens. So a 50 millimeter lens on a camera with a 1.5 crop factor on an APS-C gives you a true equivalent field of a 75 millimeter on a full frame or a 35 millimeter film camera. So the crop factor on DSLRs, DSLRs do a change focal length because of the crop factor, depending on no, the- No, no, mm -hmm. no. The, the specifics said. are in the wording of the document. Equivalent. <laughs> equivalent that yeah. does not mean that it becomes a 50 millimeter or an 80 millimeter yeah it's plus or minus we're talking so about magnification basically at this point yeah okay okay so the lens is still a 50. so if you're using a 35 millimeter lens pekka and you got a crop factor of 1.5 or 1.6 you just times it by 50 and that's your new one can you copy and paste that link in there for me I don't think I can in the chat because you can in the what mean equivalent? What means equivalent? Same as, close to? Yeah, same as, close to, rough ballpark. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. It's a not fifty be millimeter an exact number. Yeah, yeah so it's going to be the bokeh, a little bit close to All it. the effects <laughs> that you would expect to get if you used a true fifty millimeter on a full frame are not present when putting it on a crop sensor with the crop factor of 1.6. So again, if, but if you use the same DSLR on a telescope, Paul, is that going to change? It may. You may get the entire sensor, which means you're going to get vignetting, but you're yeah. actually getting more pixels. More light than the sensor can hold. Well, just yeah. there's no more pixels. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just overspill. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, if you imagine here, I can show you. Yeah. This, this. Let's see here. Let's go to this. <laughs> this, this is the equivalent. Is the equivalent. Right, here. right here. This is the equivalent this is the equivalent of this, of shot. this shot. It's the it's same, same shot, shot, but we're just but we're using just this good. much of the frame. That's okay. what we're talking about. Make sense? Makes sense. Rebecca, it would. Now, again, this Emulate. is a telephoto lens. Does it mess it up? I mean, the show. No, you didn't mess up no, the no. show. No, you didn't mess it up, Pekka. <laughs> it's part of it, buddy. 
Next question. <laughs> Next question. I hope, I hope that last demonstration makes sense. Yeah. Waiting on you. <laughs> Do you see Bob what from the prices, right? See what I have to deal with? Yeah. yeah. It's easy. Okay. All nice. right. Apollo astronaut foot Apollo astronaut footprints could last up to twenty thousand years. True. That is false. Fiddlesticks. Because of the radiation produced by everything. It'll actually last up. Well, it's kind of true, but kind of false. It'll actually last up to a to to <laughs> to 10 to 100 million years. Yeah. <laughs> I tricked Kit on that one yesterday. <clears throat> so anyways, yeah. So yeah, you're right. Because of the, um, because moon rocks erode at a rate of 0 0.04 inches every 1 million years. So basically they're still up there right now. Yes. And they probably still look fresh they, as they, can they, be. They will probably be up there until my kids, 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 kids. <laughs> uh, a million years, a hundred million years. Okay. So it, uh, space is always cold. Yes. False. Well, if I'm near the damn sun, or dang sun. In the darkest part of space, temperatures can reach, reach negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you are orbiting near Earth in the sunlight, space is a toasty 250 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warm. Astronaut spacesuits are white to reflect the heat they encounter while floating above the Earth. Did you know that? No. I don't like these types of things. <laughs> I'm Tyler, torturing you right now. So excited! You better study up because you and Ken are going to have a standoff next week. Oh, fiddle! Ah, a year on Venus is shorter than a day there. A year on Venus is shorter than a day there. True. That is true because it sounds so weird, right? That's why you said it was true. No. <clears throat> Venus, Venus spins very slowly slowest, in the opposite direction yeah. of Earth, 243 Earth days for a full rotation, but it only takes 225 days to go around the sun because it is so close. Therefore, a year on Venus is shorter than a day. Take a breath and read it slower in case people want to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the International Space Station is the size of three football fields. That's false. How big is it? It's bigger than that. How big do you think it is? It's five football fields. You are wrong, yeah, but you are right saying it's false. The International Space Station is 357 feet long, just three feet less than an American football field. <sighs> Darn it. It weighs 925,000 pounds and is the largest single human man, human made structure to ever enter space. Do you know how fast it goes? No, tell me that. And uh, we must Google it. It goes fast. It goes real we fast. We should Google it and find I out. I think it's over 16,000 miles an hour. Six, over 16,000? Like if you're on that, can you feel you can't that? can feel that. Really? You can see it from Earth. It's just... You can actually, it, it'll play a trick with you uh, because there are particular, and our mounts do this as well. You can program the mount to track the International Space Station, but when you look at it far past the horizon, it barely looks like it's coming at you until it breaks a certain plane, we'll say 45 degrees, and then it just zips, and then it just goes on forever. Mm, How fast. Now he's going to look it up. Uh, ISS. correctly. That's miles per second. I need to 17,000 se miles. 17,500 miles, which yeah. is 28,000 kilometers per hour. Yeah. At this speed, the ice orbits the Earth every 90 mm -hmm. minutes. Holy cow. That gives the crew 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. And just think, it's only 254 miles above the Earth. That's crazy. That's just a two hour and a two and a half hour drive. <laughs> okay. Now, um, you would last 15 seconds in space without a space suit. You will last 16 seconds? 15. That's false. It's instantaneous. <laughs> there is no air in space. It's you are like, wrong. Yeah, well. <laughs> Uh, this statement is true because there's no pressure in space. Air expands. This means the air inside your lungs would expand and tear through the tissue. <laughs> and in such an extreme environment, your body would use up all of the oxygen and in your blood in, in about 15 seconds. Osmosis. <laughs> Osmosis 007. I love it. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's uh, 
Okay, this one this one I thought was interesting. Oh boy. It is impossible to become a space outlaw. I mean, I would accept the term space pirate, but no, it is not. Mm, this is impossible to become a space outlaw. False. He is correct. Astronauts, mu uh, astronauts may be in free fall, but outer space isn't a free for all. There's a special space law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, play there, on words. I don't, well, I got it out off of that yeah. off this internet. Anyways, there are there are special space laws governed by the Uni United Nations Office uh, for Outer Space Affairs to make sure that space doesn't become a war zone or nuclear test site. Among them, no one can put a weapon of mass destruction in orbit. Space exploration must be limited to peaceful means. And any country that launches an object is responsible for damage it causes. So all of these um, uh, aliens comes to the world and destroys it. Movies is incorrect because they would be considered space outlaws. Technically, they are. I'm just saying all those movies, you know, where they come and they try to destroy us. and That's because they usually do in the movies. You've seen Independence Day? Have you seen all three yeah, of them? Yeah, that's a real... I haven't seen all three of them. <laughs> you seen all three the of them? The one with Will Smith Even Mars good. Attacks. Mars Attacks. Still attack. come and invade. Because <laughs> they don't care about laws. They don't care about laws. They don't care about no laws. Okay, okay now this is the bonus round. Bonus I, didn't, round. I didn't look to see how many you got right or how many you got wrong. Not enough. I just didn't keep track. Okay, no, so these are actual questions. Okay. Is outer space empty? No. No. We found life on Mars, supposedly. Uh, all the planets. We're also we're all in outer space. We're in outer space. So, so that right no, there right. says no, it is not empty. We're in outer space. So besides the obvious stars and planets, you might think that the surrounding space is completely empty, a perfect vacuum devoid of all matter. It's true that space is a vacuum, but it is an imperfect Nebula. vacuum because it contains a, contains a low density of particles like clouds of interstellar dust, space plasma, and cosmic rays. What? Is there a video list that covers the use of PMC-8 and other systems, for example, Astrobear and Stellar Ray? Unfortunately, Josiah, no. Uh, not on the Astroberry or Stellar Mate. Uh, there is on the ASI Air. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with those systems at all. I use the ASI Air personally. I don't think we have any tutorials on um, other systems being used with the PMC-8, except I don't even think we have our Explore Stars but it's all um, set up. It, it's all Raspberry Pi related, so it's it should be all open source. So you should be able to to manipulate it some way or fashion. Uh, if you go to the groups IO pack, groups IO section, groups .io PMC8, and you ask that question there after you create a profile, um, a lot of more experienced people with those said products mm -hmm. will be able to answer that question for yeah. sure. That may use an astral berry or a stellar mate. I like that name, Josiah. Okay. <clears throat> Why does space appear black? Because it's black. It's empty. I don't, I don't know. Is that racist? You took it there. Now it's going to be. <laughs> Why does space appear black? This ph phenomenon is known as Olber's paradox, named from the German astro astronomer Heinrich, Wil Heinrich. Wilhelm. Heinrich. Heinrich. Wilhelm Olbers. Do you, do you need help pronouncing the name? No, you're just, you guys keep interrupting me. This is what Kitten and Kitten doing yesterday. Um, po posed in 1823, if the 1823. universe is infinite, and timeless, then everywhere you look should eventually hit a star. You ought to get Scott to do these one day. I've done this with Scott. Hmm. I'm now done with Scott. I've done it with Kent, and now I'm doing it with you. You're you're just the the, the grumpier last, one of all of them. The Should eventually hit a star. It turns out the universe is neither static nor timeless. Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding, and thermal radiation left over from the Big Bang puts the universe at 13.8 billion years. We don't see stars in every direction because some stars haven't been around long enough for their light to reach us. True. All so of a sudden, one day, it's just going to be a massive 
bright sky. You think? Because, you know, new stars. You go to Alaska, it's all day all the time. All the time? <laughs> but do you think that that many stars <laughs> would have been... I know, I don't think you can... Mm -hmm. Anything's possible. How much, how much of the solar system mass does the sun take up? How does it say it one more time? How much what? of the solar system mass does the sun take up? 0. 0.012. Solar system. It's talking about yeah, power 0. solar 0. I don't want to say 0.5. I don't know. No it idea. takes up 0.5% of the solar system. 50%. I have no idea. Any. 90. <laughs> no idea. 99.8% of the entire solar system's no mass. The rest of the solar system is a speck of dust in comparison. Kind of like on the, the IR sensor from the James Webb on Jupiter. Speck of dust. Speck of dust. The speck of dust. Okay. I'm doing terrible with these questions. You're going to have to study up because you and Ken are going to have competition oh, next week. Lord. Continue. And I'm still waiting on questions from our audience at, at Explore Alliance at ExploreScientific.com. Okay. Um, how many black holes are at the center of the Milky Way? Oh, Lordy. Oh, gosh. Here comes Lucy. Two. Is there two? Three, maybe? You think there's two or three two at or the three. center of the Milky Way? At the center of the Milky Way. What is it? How many black holes are at the center of the Milky Way? One. I don't know. 57 billion. It looks like just He's one. Horrible. He's a lot closer. Uh, two. No. <laughs> no. According to a new study, there are tens of thousands of black holes at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Black I was holes right. are impossible to detect on their own because light can't escape defense, from them. In my defense, I did not go to school But to when paired... You did not go to school? Pictures of space. That's totally different. <laughs> you did not go to school, Tyler? But when paired with the star, they interact in a way that allows science to find them using x-rays the study so you're using tens of millions of dollars of the study equipment. poses that the center of the milky way contains hundreds of black holes paired with stars and ten thousand isolated would be, black holes that would be cool to see in that x-ray photo it would be really cool to see the x-ray i'm sure you could probably google would it you be it. looking at the bones of the universe that's kind of what it would be like wouldn't it no mm. that was something that has just it's in space, free floating have bones. So Tyler, it's called alliteration. But since you didn't get to, didn't go to school, I forgive you. This is a PG show. <laughs> How many stars are in the universe? These are like questions I feel like Daxton would ask. Seventy-two quadrillion. In yeah, infinite number. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We don't but we Google can Plex. guess. The Milky Way no, galaxy no. contains about 100 the billion James stars. James Webb can look 13 billion light years before the Big Bang. Okay, you, the Milky me Way galaxy. That, that we've counted all those stars so far? Listen. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tyler. I'm arguing with a teenager. You did gosh. this. The Milky Way galaxy. <laughs> The Milky, the Milky Way galaxy contains about 100 billion stars. If you multiply that by the estimated number of galaxies in the observable universe, oh, 10 trillion is a modest guess. Infinite. You get a number that is one with 24 zeros after it, one septillion. Well, what we're learning from Webb is that most universe. of the stars are actually galaxies. Yes. But this is just an estimation. I mean, it's just a guess. And, and, and this professor says that he, he believes that that number is way too low. Can you imagine sitting there on a telescope counting one, two, three, four, five, right, and then your twice. pizza gets delivered and you're like, oh, man. So here's the deal. Um, <laughs> would you, uh, I, will, I will use these questions next week if you can remember them. We'll not be able to remember them. I'll sleep then. I'll sleep since then. Is that all the questions? I got one more. Go for it. What, then, what are some things that, that the images from the James Webb telescope revealed? Chorizo. <laughs> That's true. What a chorizo looks like. Uh, what a chorizo looks like. No, that's not. 
Uh, you got to see Stevens tw uh, triplet, um, Jupiter in IR. What else? What else? What else? What uh, else? Well, you don't have to say specific names. Oh. Like, just uh, he's he's he hates this. I'm looking at him on the TV. He's like rubbing his head, rubbing his head. Mm -hmm. So what what was the question again? What are some things that the images from the James Webb Telescope revealed? I did not realize that Jupiter actually had rings. Mike Wiesner says, does Tyler know what Google and Googleplex are? No, Mike, I do not, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I think I think next week we'll do phone a friend. We'll no. do we'll add some we'll that, add some that, we'll add cheating. some things to it. Come on, Regis. Phone a friend. I have no friends. You have to have friends to phone them. But Jupiter having rings was pretty incredible to see. Tyler, there's a few things you can do to make friends. Yeah. <laughs> ne okay, so it revealed like never before seen cosmic details like newborn stars yep. and ancient galaxies. Yep. It was, I mean, it's amazing what that thing's done. And it's been hit by me. See, meteors. it was just a simple answer and you were trying to get all in. <laughs> Hateful. Sometimes, see, I had to see. I had to throw some easy ones in there because Tyler's told me he doesn't know that much. I, I don't. I really don't. That's that's Tyler. I work for a telescope. <clears throat> you gave yeah. us this picture for what reason? I gave you that picture. Oh, this picture is amazing. I want to see if you can tell me what lens it was taken with. A, B, what it is. I have no reference point to tell you what the lens is. But you're the amazing photographer. I don't all photography. Shoot the sky. I this is film you're missing out by not people. People this are more interesting to me. The I headless apologize. voice, um, the headless voice, voice. The headless voice is Paul. <laughs> I have those voices. Um, he is. <laughs> I really have. I was literally up for until two a.m. No, no. Central Standard Time. We don't care about your sleeping habits. Okay. I so have no sleeping habits at this point. I was helping a customer who is a world-renowned scientist at JPL. Get his mouth up and running. Okay, so now that we've thrown drop names and hats, the, the the headless voice is Paul. Unfortunately, it is. He is our world renowned photographer that doesn't like space. I it's like space. Sad. It's just not very, my thing. Did, uh, Tyler did really good, but um, we had a hard time trying to get this on Lightroom. We don't know. I don't know. I don't never use. I think it was just. Have asked pick. me. Maybe. I mean, you'd have to take some time and go through them and pick so many. Yeah. Um, I think the I'm more zoomed in pretty um, good there. That's a D. That's a deep I think the data more, I photo. Think, you know, the more you do it, I think you'd yeah. be able to know which ones to pick. Agreed. Say again, Paul. So I'm zoomed in really close. Um, so that's he says a it very was taken with big an photo. Millimeter. Close. It was close. It was taken with an 85 millimeter, 1.8. So Tyler looks like a dad who just got done with a 14 hour shift at the foundry only to have the neighbor kids ask about IRS tax code. <laughs> Osmosis gets it. I love it. This is awesome. So, Paul, if you could zoom back out real quick for me. I did. So, that is the core of the Milky Way taken with a Nikon Z62 that has been modified um, with a visible, visible spectrum hydrogen alpha filter that I took 35 out of, what was it, 240 good ones, stacked them in PixInsight, processed it, and bam. Process. Processed. And if you need to go, then go. Uh, in the middle is uh, the Lagoon Nebula, and right above it, the two little puffy clouds right above the M20 or Lagoon is the Triffid Nebula. Um, I'm going to try to get a wider shot uh, with a 24 millimeter right there yeah. well it, of the core of the galaxy is that uh, what you're because, talking about say again paul is that what you're talking about the core of the oh yes that's the triffid it's amazing how i can pick up blue uh, with a dedicated hydrogen alpha dslr uh-oh something happened there it went. Resetting it. Is it resetting it? Okay. Um, but yeah, that's it. Took some time to get uh, for sure. I was just wanting to let Paul see it and let him know what he's missing. He's probably picking out all this. All my stars are elongated, in which they are. I've put it on a move, shoot, move. The polar alignment wasn't the best, but you know, not bad for an 85 millimeter. 
Let's see. Um, say again. I said, I'm going to look and see here. Oh, boy. He's going to pixel peep. He's going to pixel peep of the pixel peep. Nah, but nah. They're not too bad. What was they it? Are about a little... a, it was probably what, what? Each photograph was like about, what, eight seconds? No. Uh, over 30 seconds. Almost close to a mount. On a mount, though. Yeah, it, it's a tracking mount. Yeah. Okay. Because <clears throat> without the mount, you can't really go much further you, than 10 not seconds. With 80, not if you use a 500 rule on an 85. That's yeah. whatever that number is, like 10, 15 seconds, less than 10 seconds, yeah. I think. Yeah. On the outside of the picture is where you look to see those things because oh, the yeah. lens Chrom gets a little bit wonky. You know, well, no, well, it's just it's just it's bent. Yeah, you know? well, it's chromatic aberration. No, or spherical. The, what is it? Spherical? Yeah. yeah. There you, spherical you're aberration? No. It's it's just bent. That's all. Yeah. Just bent light. That's, they don't have if a field flight, and that's what happens. You can, if you want to check to see your lens, to see where this bend is in mm -hmm. your lens, there's a really yeah. good way to do it. You can do this oh. with your iPhone right now. If you take your phone, point it at you, yeah. and you get it. And you get it. Close, close you'll see your nose start to get bigger oh i see what right you're saying. so the yeah. lens is causing that and we call it getting in the lens getting in the lens yeah something yeah. here so what what happens is your pixels on the outside of your photograph start to bend because the lens has a concave or a convex to it. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing on the outside of your on the outside of your mm -hmm. picture. Very faint Very though. Your 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 still my image. Your software still has still deleted here. most of it. Yeah, um, I did crop a little bit out of it, but it was taken with a uh, uh, that. Uh everybody's still going on my Google. I guess I'm going to have to kick out, check out Google Plex. I don't know what Googleplex is. I don't either. Mike is teaching me the ways. Um, but that's all I really got. You don't Google have anything Plex else? Is a giant number. Go. I'm sorry. One times Googleplex is a million? giant number. Say again, Paul. The, a Googleplex Google is a giant number. Yeah, yeah Noah, number. Noah was saying um, it was one times... One times ten to like one That's too million. big of a number for me to count. Well, it's like the kid asking IRS questions like Osmosis was yeah. telling me. Uh -uh. Tyler gets to 21. He gets a little lost. Tyler's well, you're giving, you're giving me a down. lot. Yeah, <laughs> when you're running on a certain amount of people. Like, start with, so I've been told that I get to go to a Mount Wilson Observatory. That's exciting. Yeah. I get It'll to be me and Kent. In my little chair. That's fine. I'll be controlling a giant refractor, and I will try to get cell phone pictures of planets for you. <laughs> if they'll let me. If they'll let me. I don't see why they wouldn't. I have to live vicariously through everybody else because... Somebody, I will FaceTime you, Because then. somebody has to run customer service. That's why you get paid the big bucks. <laughs> I wish. That's why you get paid the big bucks. No, it's fun here. It's fun here. Um, but no, last week I went to Texas. Um, one of our dealers and wanted me hat? to, I wore a cowboy hat. And yes. boots? Um, or I had the cowboy boots. I wasn't going to buy another pair of Did you boots. buy the hat while you were down there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did. You know, you, you, you know, we are in Arkansas. We have cowboy hats here. Not an authentic <laughs> cowboy hat store. Um, yeah, we actually do have an authentic cowboy hat store. What's it called? Um, I swear to God, don't say Cavenders. <laughs> Why? That is not an authentic Who cowboy says? hat. Is not an authentic cowboy You went hat. in there. That is not a... Did you go in there? Cavenders? Yes. Yeah, they have one in Texas, and all their cowboy hats were bedazzled. Did you go in the one here? Because they're no. not bedazzled here. Yeah, no, it's, I don't know why it's in Texas, though. They're bedazzled. <laughs> I don't know why. Because it's, it's a girl's cowboy store. I think it's... Yeah, but I went to an authentic... But the Cavenders here is not like that. Well, uh, it's right near Stockyard in Fort Worth. <gasps> did you go have steak? I did, but not at the Stockyard. It was <sighs> too busy. Um, so I got a cowboy hat, put on a course about DSLR and astrophotography uh, Friday, and then that's why we didn't have a show. 
Um, Saturday, then we actually went out to a field where I shot that picture and there were 30 other individuals that were just trying out astrophotography as well. Uh, if you want to give or a look of Fort Worth camera on Instagram, a follow, they actually plugged um, some of the pictures that everybody took. There was an actual gentleman with a, a teleconverter, <clears throat> two times teleconverter on a 600 millimeter lens. So that's 1200 millimeters. And he pointed it at Saturn and shot it. What did it look like? Like Saturn. But I mean, it was still small, but you can definitely make out the rings and everything on a, on a DSLR. Non he put a 1200 on a, on a tripod. Okay. So he put, okay. Just a DSLR with a what now? A two times teleconverter. So it's like a Barlow. It's like a Barlow. Okay. Um, on a 600 millimeter lens. So it's 1200 on a tripod. That's like throwing up a Mac cast up on a, on a thing and sticking a That's like holding a Mac cast on, on your hand just holding it. I'm going to keep it That's still. insane. Keep it still. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. It's not. I mean, it, it, it was amazing what he well, did. Well, I mean, Ma I mean, Matt. If you can turn the shutter speed up, it'd be fun. See, we, we forget that we are bestowed upon the DSLR of God. No, that's the headless voice. Remember? Oh, yeah, the headless voice. Remember? You are the, now forever known as the headless who, voice. Whoever, whoever, no, they, I don't, we can't see the name of the person that named yeah. him the headless voice, but that's Facebook really nice. User. The Facebook user. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean that was. I mean, it took some time to get that photo. Yeah, there, up. there was I mean, a there was a guy that got another Milky Way shot. But his was a lot wider, mm -hmm. um, and then the headless voice has to moan. I don't know why. He's so you had a pretty good turnout. It was. Uh, there was about sixteen in the class, um, and then there was about thirty actual people show up to the practical event. So how many people? Um, I'll fight about it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that. <laughs> I was I was to, I wouldn't so um, so. How many people had telescopes and how many people had just cameras? Well, that was the thing. We, <clears throat> I asked the, the dealer of Fort Worth camera to bring uh, two IXOS 100 mounts with two telescopes. That way, if someone wanted to use a telescope and just throw on their DSLR, mm -hmm. we could. Um, we had an 80 millimeter out there for if they wanted to do it that way for wide field. We had a MatCast 152 on a Mazo 1. Uh, MatCast 127 on a German Equatorial and a, the MatCast 114 or 11400 out there on a German Equatorial. So they, we gave people the option to do visual mm -hmm. while they were taking their images because you could see the Milky Way naked eye where oh, we were. Wow. Um, I mean, it was it was a Bortle, uh, low Bortle or high Bortle 4. Just enough that you can make out some of the clouds on the, the Milky Way. So, did you take the manual telescopes just because it was e they're easier? It or? it gets the, the the participants that were out there just a feel of how they work. Oh, okay. And that's what I wanted to mix. And the same thing with the, the IXOS 100 is I literally just gave my iPad and said, "Touch these buttons to move wherever you wanted to." Go that way. Go for it. Go that way. I mean the IXOS. I mean the X the IXOS 100 is. I mean, well, the app is really easy to use and. Yeah, and I just I mean, showing them nice. how easy it was this thing was to use, and they were honestly blown away on how ease of use it was. So, what is that? What did they think about like having? Because did you did you have a camera on a manual on a telescope on a manual mount at all? No. Okay. No. Everything. Did you go over? Did you go over how difficult it would be to take pictures on a manual mount versus a tracking mount? Did we, you talk I about touched that? base on it a little bit, but since everybody uses tri used tripods anyway, yeah. since it was mainly a DSLR class, we just talked about the exposure, the 500 rule, depending on what lens cell mm -hmm. or lens that you use. I keep calling them lens cells. Um, so we talked about the 500 rule and to make sure that they understood all of that. Mm -hmm. And they stressed one word constantly, patience. Okay. And there is no such thing in astrophotography as instant satisfaction. Why not? Why because can't you just throw all this stuff together and then all of a sudden you're taking photos, these amazing photos, like like the photo you have. It did not <laughs> pop out of the camera like that, I promise Why you. Why not? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. You, you think that I can do the film that way? You can. I believe in you. You know, that's what's interesting about astro about uh, astronomy and astrophotography as we as I've learned is that and everything those pictures are beautiful. I'm absolutely gorgeous. But, I know who the Facebook user is. <laughs> oh. But um but we um 
but just to do viewing, it doesn't actually look like that. No, it doesn't. It's a gray blob. I think people don't I realize even, that. I even told them, it's like, prepare to be disappointed. Yeah. It's not, I'm setting your expectations now. If you visually see a galaxy, you're going to be disappointed because it's not like it is in the magazine. And that's what I think is interesting is people come in, and, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but people come in with their expectations of seeing what's on a photo, like what you what you've created out of, out of out of like an NT114, National yeah. Geographic, Newtonian, yeah. little tiny Newtonian, and then it's like, sorry, it's not really news, what it is. How it works. Looks like and so you have to go it's really it's it's kind of it's kind of sad when we have to tell them that's not well, what you're going to see to me so much whenever i try to do something and you know how same problem it's what your approach what is he talking about i don't know I'm taking my dark library to have my 294 mc pro inside the refrigerator while the ambient take them a whole lot of them at the same night well the, the so pekka on darks I know you had a question about darks, flats, and biases earlier today. Darks can be taken whenever, um, as long as they're around the same ambient temperature that you use the camera. But a lot of people, I don't do this, but I've, I've known people that do it. They take their dedicated camera, put a cap on the lens cover, throw it in the fridge, and you can take darks that way. Well, that's what he's saying. He put yeah. his camera in there and was actually taking photos while in yeah. it. Um, which have ambient tip of negative or four degrees Celsius, which that's, uh, it's four degrees. That's interesting that you take your photos in the, it's darks. So it doesn't matter. You could trick somebody and say, I'm just trying to see if the little man with the light comes out and turns on the light. Oh, I've seen him. <laughs> he's a big hairy thing. He's a big hairy thing. Sometimes he's about four foot tall and he's got a lunchable in his hand. He takes <laughs> off running. <laughs> Must be your son. Cause he's my kid. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, you said he's hairy. He, he's got a bunch of hair on top. Oh. oh he took yeah, all my hair. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, so we're going to be having, um, I know some of you guys aren't local, but I'm going to go ahead and say this. So if anybody mm. else that's local um, watches it, or if you want to come visit us, you can. Please. So therefore, I'm going to say that we are going to be having our first ever star party for the Explore Store. It's the grand reopening. But the it's star a, party but it's a star bonus. party. The it's star the party's bonus. the bonus, That's and it's a grand bonus. reopening. And we're going to be having. Um, we're going to be having drawings, um, sales. We're going to have food. Food, raffles, which are drawings. Um, mm -hmm. What time does it start again? It's early in the morning. No. Oh darn! It starts on. It's going to be September thirtieth. Um, I think time. it's going to go four to ten. Okay. And then Saturday, sept or sep October first, from yep. ten to ten. Because then that, that following same week, I leave. You wish. No, I have to go to California. So, um, so if you are, we are in the process of trying to get our followers up and going on our Instagram and Facebook. You have done phenomenal with the Thank store, Thank you by the way. very much. You have done really well. So, if you would like to go and follow that, we. What are they following? You didn't tell them. I'm going to in just a oh, minute. Okay. Just confused. Are going to build a water rocket. You need can, to go to the go to Explore Store AR on Instagram. Can we use the headless horseman as the air? As the what? The headless voice as the air. The air. The, he's the air pump. Oh God. He's the air pump. I'd like to know if the different temp gain and offset calibration has to be on the dedicated catalogs or it could be the same off. All right, Pekka, so I'm going to give you just, this is what I do. I literally take darks. I create a dark folder. I put all my darks in there. I use the same darks for everything. I might update them. If I'm, if I'm not taking my image train apart, now I use a monochrome setup. If I don't take my filters out, I don't disassemble my telescope, it's, nothing changes. I might redo the dark six months later. Biases, same thing. If I don't take anything apart, I don't mess with them again. I just create one master set and I use those for every image. Again, I'm gonna stress this, if I don't take anything apart. If I can do it in a controlled environment, there's no dust on the lens cell or anything, I just take one set of 50 darks, 50 flats, 50 biases, uh, darks and flats have to be the same temp and exposure set. So I always do a range of 180 or I've done 
180, uh, 300 and 900 seconds on all of those. Uh, I set my temp negative 10. I don't change it. I, my, the camera, in my opinion, you see no visible difference between negative 10, 15 and 20, negative 10, just do negative 10 and you're fine. Uh, just that's, that's, I don't mess with the temperature. I have it all set to negative 10 and I, I don't change it. Um, some people do flats after each imaging session. I, I don't, again, I, my stuff stays where it's at all the time. So that's the good thing about astrophotography. You get to experiment a lot. I mean, not everybody's systems are built the same. Uh, not, but everybody's environments are the same. So you have to experiment, unfortunately. But darks and biases, you take them with a lens cap off or lens cap on. Flats and darks, you have to take the same lights, same light frames, same temperature, same exposure the whole time on those two. And then biases are just quick as it can. Um, but I think that's the show. I think that's it. You interrupted me. Oh. I was answering. I was. Questions. I know, but I was in the middle so of. So if set, I take I was negative in... twenty at one hundred, I. I would say yes, Petka. Try it. See what you get. Try it and see what you get. Ow. I'm not sure on the two nine four what the offset is. Uh, we have paid for sixty minutes. <laughs> Please insert more money. <laughs> 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 um, sorry, but I interrupted you. I was well. I was just giving the Instagram page and the Facebook page, you know. So Excuse that's me. you know that's. I mean, if Paul was there. nice, I mean, if he'd pull it up. For uh, us. Yeah, if he was nice, he would put the link in there or something. I don't know about all that, but or he know. could just show the page. Or he could just show the page. That would be great what too. You want to see? The Explore Store. If you go to Instagram, actually, you know what? I we want to blow something I up. So, so please follow us. I have this ability. <gasps> you can share. I'll do it. So we can do alleviate it, it. Paul from all responsibilities. You're going to have to log in. <laughs> I know you are, buddy. That's why I'm taking over for you. Explore store. It helps if I can spell correctly. He cannot spell a or. There it is. So we're going to go back here. Boop. And we're going to go back here. We're going to go here. We're going to go here. And then we're going to go over here. Wow! Shabam! The Explore Store AR on Instagram and Instagram only. You have actually blown up quite a bit. Yeah, we start. Let's see. This is a week. It's been a full week, and you're at 28. And I'm at 28 followers. And you started. When was it? Let's find out. Bump. Uh, August 24th. Been a little over. Nope. Yep, it's been a little over a week. Yeah. Grand reopening this weekend, right? So our grand reopening is, I think I put it on there. Our grand reopening is the move September 30th. 30th to October 1st. So yes. Yep. So we gotta, but we're going to do that live. We're going to, we're going to launch that uh, water rocket well, I, there's live. A, there's a catch to that, right? I think there's a catch to that. We have to get to a hundred followers. So that's why I'm saying go followers. make Paul Thanks. follow us. Oh, darn. <laughs> Look, sorry, Paul. We just, just gained like, another follower. Just, just like, just like that, you just need to click that, and you can begin to follow <laughs> click us. That follow button. And now we're at twenty nine. What's, what, what's followers. going on? Nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Nothing. Don't worry about it. So yeah, y'all want to? You want to go on there and follow that because we are actually Tyler's going to drink a two liter bottle of Coke. We're going to turn that sucker into a into a water rocket, and we're going to shoot it off. So y'all really Dying need Coke. to. I'm gonna swell up like a balloon. I'm swell up like a balloon. I haven't had Coke and Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Regular Coke doesn't. I work. mean, he's trying to make all of us jealous around here with his what fitness going on. You're trying to rub off, you know. I'm trying to rub weights. off. He's not rubbing off anything. He's just uh, making us all want to throw it. candy at him more. <laughs> I don't care. He can do whatever he wants. <laughs> you never care about him. No, I'm just kidding. He's done good. He's done good. Anyways, uh, so yeah, y'all start following us, and we will, and we're gonna, we are, we're gonna build, we're gonna build a water rocket. So is next off. week is it me and Kent off on the questionnaire next week? It's you and Kent on Explore Alliance Minutes on oh, Thursday. Oh, okay, okay. So nothing on Friday. Okay. And so we will be um, having 
a showdown. Showdown. So Tyler, you better start studying. Yeah, I like to wing it. <laughs> what? Okay, so what Ken and I? Okay, wait, listen. What mm -hmm. Ken and I figured out that the loser has to buy me and the winner lunch. What? Yep. The loser has to buy does the, me does the loser get to choose? and Ken lunch. Loser gets or me choose. and me and the winner are lunch. Loser gets to choose. No, we we chose we chose a steakhouse. <laughs> See, this whole thing is just to get lunch. It's just for Annie to get lunch. Because you notice, no, no matter what Kent, happens. Go back, go back and watch it. Kit is the one. Kent but she one just said, said no matter what happens, no matter who he would, wins, he would, he, he said she lunch. gets a free lunch. Any shows? Oh, that's a great question, Mike. No. Are we having shows on Monday? No. Most likely not. Um, that's a holiday, so uh, Daniel, Daniel Barth will probably be taking the day off. I am not going to be here. I mean, we don't need you to stream. Some of us might stream. I, I, actually, I actually gave you instructions that are very, very detailed, and yet... I can use my iPhone and just get on the Explore Scientific Facebook page and stream from there. <sighs> don't need you. Okay. Dun, dun. So, anyway, so anyway, so next Thursday, we're going to have this, this show off between Kent and Tyler. Obviously, Tyler just now realizes that he better start studying because he's going to be that's buying. A, that's the He's going to be buying a steak dinner. I don't know what to study. Mm. <laughs> Why are we black? <laughs> we, we know that no, we went dark. Tyler said he didn't need me. Oh, Tyler said he didn't. I don't need you. All so you did was hit a button. <laughs> all you did was hit a button. Don't don't make our guy go away, please. Don't make our head don't make our headless voice go away. Don't make us headless voices. There's already one. We don't need more. All right. Are we ready? I are we done? It. I think that's it. Improvise. I would. <laughs> I would. I would extremely improvise. Improvise. Yep. In improvise. All hey right. Mike, thanks for thanks for reminding us about Monday. So yeah, Monday there won't be a show. Uh Tues Tuesday we will have um Global Star Party. Wednesday is how are we doing the global star party. Scott's can he'll be back, won't he? No, he's gone for a whole nother week. He's gone for two weeks. Oh well, weeks. I guess we're pushing that back another week. Oh, that would be nice to know. Okay, so um, <laughs> I thought he's only gone for a week. Like I, I two weeks. told Mark, our communication may be an issue, but we just don't talk about that. Peck is all mad because we're not staying till five. <laughs> he wants a refund. That's fine, Pekka. If you contact the customer service email departments at service at Explore Scientific. That we don't answer. We'll get... <laughs> How do you give away the secrets? That communication thing is supposed to be silence. <laughs> no, we actually answer it. But he didn't pay any money, so therefore there's no refund possible. You can't no, get a refund don't off get of zero. refund off, off of live demonstration purposes. Got here late. Oh, yeah. Artem Artemis is so launching. Everyone on the Artemis feed, no launch feeds. Nice. All right. I'm Anyways, done. I'm out. so tomorrow, so next, oh, so I was going over shows Tuesday. I Tuesday. I don't know if Artemis is launching now or not. So Wednesday is Kent with uh, First Light Chronicles. Thursday is going to be our big showdown. And then Friday we'll be focused on astrophotography. No, it's for Saturday. It's launching yeah. Saturday. It's launch. I don't know, Paul. Can you? Is it possible for you to stream that? I know you're not going to be here, but can you right. just like watch the whole time? Because there are people that actually Hang on. that record it when it's not doing anything. Just the launch pad. Hanging. On. Hanging. Hanging on. Hanging on for dear life. Does NASA, Does NASA have a? Live they stream do. just sitting there. I think they do, but don't quote me. NASA. If they do, if I they could do, just I stream do. it. But I mean, what's the point? Just go there. Because this is explore scientific. Yeah, but it's, yeah, but it's whatever. whatever. Don't whatever me. You ask questions, you get answers. Uh, answers are answers. generally coherent and cohesive. Why don't you just type in Artemis Live? Because I don't, I don't think know if it's a, I don't yeah. I don't think it's NASA TV. No, no. It's not it's not there's not a camera not a just camera. sitting there. Oh no, it's on YouTube itself. Like there there's people that actually watch that stream just the pad. The for the right next now. for the next since since twenty four hours? 
Less than 24 hours? Well, because they're putting everything together and getting it ready. Oh, the ship's thing. already on pad. I guarantee it. Well, I'm still I'm sure they're still doing stuff to it. Yeah, they got to fix the leak. Well, I'm if sure the leak is it. fixed if they're going to shoot it off tomorrow. Yeah, it, well, it, it passed standard. It passed standard. It's unmanned. It's unmanned. Doesn't mean it still can't hurt somebody. That's true. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, it's got to be technical with everything. But that's it here on Focus on Astrophotography. Hopefully, I'll actually have a guest on. We'll see. But I'm I do, not considered a guest. I do kind of like the, the trivia aspect of it, even though I'm not the smartest person to be asking trivia questions to. But, yeah, see, right there. Space Oddities will broadcast tomorrow. But, unfortunately, Paul will not be here. Um, so, fiddlesticks. Fiddlesticks. Hey, if you know where it's going to be broadcasted, put it on there. Yeah. NASA has a two-hour window. I do. I do. Yeah. So it's not till later, late in the day. That's cool. All right. Now we I are might with... stream from... I might go to Donnie's house and stream that. Maybe. Why are you going to Donnie? Like, can you not his... scream it from your own... Ha- st- scream it. <laughs> yeah, scream it. No, stream I gotta, it from your own house? I got to help him um, with his observatory and his mount. So, I miss Donnie. He, hasn't he, been only, in he, a while. he doesn't live far. He hasn't been in in a while. It works. I know that thing that we don't do here work. Ugh. What are we doing right now? Fun. <laughs> Fun. So. It is now Tyler Tyler's bedtime, looking at you, so Tyler. we're going to hop on off because it is Tyler's bedtime. He missed his nap, his afternoon nap, and so he needs to go back to bed. So we are going to sign off. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.